I'm here with uh, Gareth L. Powell um, at Nine World Geek Fest, and uh, we're catching up. We hadn't caught up before, Gareth. Uh, thanks for talking to me again. It's, uh, it's a pleasure to, to see you again. We get the chance to speak to you, uh, and uh, you're you're on the the panel for a few things, and you're also doing uh, just come from a book signing. Well, yeah. Literally nabbed you from a book signing. Um, when we spoke to you the last time, you you just uh, recently released the, the recollection, and um, that was a work which obviously you said was you were quite proud of. Um, how, how's it been going with that? Is uh, you're getting good traction out of that? Yeah, that's been going uh, going very well, and uh, I've just uh, released as well the last book in the uh, Macaque trilogy, uh, Macaque Attack. Um, yeah, which which is a great name. Yeah, <laughs> um, but that that links back to the recollection as well, which is is nice because it makes a nice uh, sort of uh, four book series that I've done with Solaris now. They're all, they're all interlinked, so um, okay. it'd be a nice nice to round off the series like that. Yeah, uh, do, do you like to interlink between your stories? That a lot of authors do end up doing that, despite. If they the different storylines, kind of interlinking them one into the other. It, it wasn't the plan, yeah. but um, at the, the towards the end of the, the trilogy, when I started to get into alternate worlds, and I needed some characters to come into the book, and the characters from the recollection were there waiting, and it just seemed so obvious and such a nice way to fold both those worlds together. Yeah, I suppose it, it, it makes sense in, in general, uh, probably in, in genre fiction, because. If you're thinking about it, you're exploring vast universes, and, and of course, there's all kinds of possibilities. So, so why not weave them? Um, as a monk did that quite well with uh, his various series as well. Um, is, is it something you, you think you'll be exploring a bit more, or is it you're just going to leave it to see how it goes? I, I don't know. I, didn't, I mean, technically, I could pretend everything I wrote now was set in <laughs> the same multiverse. It was just a different part. So yeah. you, know, you never know. But uh, no, it's not part of the plan. Yeah. Um, well, uh, Ak -Ak, uh, that that trilogy with uh, Ak -Ak -Ak -Ak, um that that was the one which really launched things for you. And um, it, it, are you finished with that now? Do you feel, have a feeling you're finished with that, or are you you gonna have to put it on the shelf for a while? Well, I, I originally wrote it as a short story, right? And I thought I was finished with it then, and then it turned into a novel, and then it turned into two novels, and then it became you know a trilogy. So. Um, became a comic strip in 2000 AD, so I mean, who knows what's going to happen with that next. Um, I think I'm done with the story and the characters for the moment. Um, I, I said very definitely that that would be the last book. Yeah. Um, and then, a couple of months ago, I accidentally wrote an outline for a fourth book while I was on the train. Accidentally on purpose. Yeah, yeah. No, it just came to me and I thought, I'll write that down. And I thought, oh. So, you know, maybe one day I'll come back to it. Um, yeah. You know, if that's it. That's it. A big enough demand, then I can always revisit them at some point. But for now, I think I think we're done. I want to move on and try telling some different stories. Yeah, but uh, there's you mentioned before about uh, the influence of, of beat writers on, on your work as well, and, and William Gibson. Um, and so there's, there's there seems to be a distinct kind of anarchic theme, underlying theme to your influences. So so it's, that something you found very much as an influence, that like running through as a thread throughout your work as well. Definitely, definitely. Um, I'd also also say Michael Moorcock as well. When I was a teenager, I read an awful lot of Michael Moorcock, all his Eternal Champion books, and Jerry Cornelius books. I think were a very big influence, especially on the, on the Macaque trilogy. Just that that feeling of being able to jump around from universe to universe, just causing mayhem and, and being not indestructible, but you know that, that kind of freedom you get from stepping into a new universe and not obeying its rules, if you see what I mean. So um, the, there was that, and also the beats were a big influence, just in the in the sort of spontaneity of, of writing the ideas down and just getting it out, and, but also trying to be true to the characters and true to make them true to life as much as as much as you can make it talking, make them true to life, obviously. Well, yes, yeah, yeah. But uh, that that in itself maybe bringing it full circle with uh, you know evolution and then why not go back to <laughs> you know as monkeys and what would you do with a character like that? Um, you'd also you'd spoken um, you were, one of the panels that 
one of the things that you had explored was to do with Arcadia and Utopia and, and our fascination with uh, the destruction and the breakdown of, of mankind and civilization. Uh, so the, what do you think makes that so fascinating, especially within, within genre fiction? I'm not sure that panel got a lot more philosophical than I was expecting. Right. But I think, I think the, one of the big attractions of, of dystopian fiction um, is just the, the, the sudden freedom it, it gives you to, to act um, in a heroic way. It's a bit like um, uh, sort of a, a society shackles have fallen away and you can act and you can be heroic and you can go out and kill zombies and, and you know, not get. It's, it's just, I think, it's, it, I think that's the, probably the attraction of it, is that people can feel like, what would I do in that situation? I can test my mettle against you know, the elements, I can test my survival skills. I mean, I grew up in the 1980s um, as a teenager, and the thought that was at the back of everyone's mind was, what am I going to do when the bomb drops? Because mm -hmm. it was very, um, and all, all the books we read at school were like Z for Zachariah and Empty World, and, <coughs> it was all very apocalyptic, and we all thought, you know, we couldn't see, you know, by the year 2000, it would be a smoldering wasteland, and we'd be driving around in Mad Max cars, and, and, yeah. and so on. Um, and that threat's gone a bit, but I think this, the need is still there for people to think, well, if everything collapsed tomorrow, how well would I do? But what if? What yeah, would I, do? would I be Rick Grimes? Would I be you know, zombie food? It's, you know, yeah, yeah. Well, one would hope. <laughs> not, not the food. Uh, yeah. One, one of the other, one of the other panels that, that you've been on uh, this year, um, that you're involved in this year, is uh, is to do with fantasy versus science fiction. Uh, I mean, do you, do you see there being a, a real um, kind of clash in, in that sense, or do you think that they're good bedfellows? How, how do you see that that debate? Uh, that debate was a lot of fun to do on stage, and we really laid into each other. But to be honest, no, I don't think there's there. I don't think there is a divide. I think people who enjoy the one enjoy the other um, a lot of the time. And coming to a convention like this, um, having a serious debate about science fiction versus fantasy, and the debate we had wasn't serious at all. But it, having a serious one would be like going to a fish and chip shop and arguing which was best, fish or chips. Or, yeah. You know, going to a Laurel and Hardy convention, and I agree, Stan Laurel was better than Oliver Hardy. It's just, it, you know, you need both of them, and both, both, both of them complement each other and go well with each other. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Uh, also, I mean, you've spoken not, not only uh, when it comes to science fiction and fantasy, but also in, in different mediums that, that you work with. And there's a lot of authors around who who work uh, in books and also in comics and people who come from screenwriting backgrounds and, and you'd spoken about uh, also with Black Cat, um being made into a, a comic. Uh, is that something you're, you're keen to look into a bit more? Um, yes, I wrote, I wrote um, to tie in with the release of the first Black Cat book from Solaris and obviously Solaris are owned by the same company who owned 2000 AD. Mm -hmm. So they, they, we thought it'd be a nice idea to tie in the release of the book with a, um, a short comic strip. So I wrote a short prequel to the book and um, they, they illustrated it. Um, and that was a dream come true because I've been reading 2000 AD since I was nine years old and I've still got my old annuals. So that, that was fun. That was, yeah, it's very much an area I'd like to get into more is, is, is um, writing comics and scripting comics. Um, but it's not something I've, I've been so busy writing novels at the moment, it's not something I've very actively followed up. Yeah. Uh, do, do you find any clashes in that sense between, uh, I don't know, audiences maybe turning more towards uh, graphic novel formats and, and uh, other media formats and maybe veering away from books a bit? I don't know because they're, they're so very different. Um, it's a very different, as reading experiences, they're very different things to write as well. So it's, you can tell very different stories um, in a novel than you can tell in a graphic novel. I think you don't get the um, quite the same level of, of sort of interior life of the characters. You know, um, sort of small caption boxes, but you don't quite get the same depth. I think, um, which is not to say that comics are shallow. Obviously, there's some fantastic um, graphic novels out there, but I think they're very, very different reading experiences. Well, graphic novels more akin in that way to 
to TV or movies. And, yeah. And now you have to do more with the, the actual action sequences on the screen as opposed to you can write a, a bit about more about what's going on internally in the, in the thinking. Yeah, and um, in a comic or, or a, a screenplay, um, if you want them to walk into like a weird alien landscape, you just make the landscape, whereas in a novel you have to spend two or three pages describing it. So, it's, it's, but then the, the reader gets to make it in their head. So it's yeah, it's very different kind of experience. Uh, one of uh, one of the other interviews we've done had spoken about the influence of, of movies on on writing in particular, and, and how you find a lot of fiction now being framed, scenes almost being framed as if the, they were meant to be taken direct from a movie. Um, do you find that filtering into any of your work, or is it, is it something? Do you naturally just picture scenes in your head, or how does that work? Yes, I, I always tend to kind of write if I'm writing a scene. I kind of picture um, picture it and then pick out the relevant detail, you know, suggested details just to, to bring it to life. But I think we can't escape the influence of film because it's so pervasive and we've all seen movies and we all kind of know the, the language of movies now, the kind of dramatic language of movies. Um, so when you're writing an action book, it's very, very hard to stay away from um, Die Hard and Terminator and all these hundreds of movies you've seen and you have to really try hard not to sort of slip into the cliches of the genre now because they are so pervasive in the culture that you know everybody, you know, let's get out of here is apparently the most um, widely spoken line of dialogue in any in films of all time. Um, and so you have to be very careful not to sort of slip into that, very careful not to not to try and um, your book doesn't end up like a, a, a James Bond novel with a, you know, a villain in an oil rig staring like a cat. Yes, yeah. you have to. You have to be very careful not to not to fall into that. I suppose uh, science fiction for for a long time wasn't best served by by movies because it was uh, it tended to be very twee and you know, quite a bit of the, the Flash Gordon esque kind of uh, treatment where where it was almost too camp, um, where it seems to be getting. The impression that it's getting a bit more ma uh, mature in terms of, say, for instance, with the, the Battlestar Galactica remake that fairly recently. Um, do you think that that is happening a lot more in science fiction, even things from Christopher Nolan and works like that? I, th I think so. I think there's a, there's a sort of uh, a fashion for grittiness at the moment, which I'm not. I think can be overdone. It's starting to become a bit of a visual cliche in itself. Um, especially with the, the sort of DC, you know, everything's washed out in blue and grey, and it's uh, uh, it's not quite so, you know, it's becoming a, a parody of itself almost. Mm -hmm. But I think there's a there is an appetite for more mature science fiction movies, definitely, and, and television. Um, I'm thinking of um, Interstellar, um, mm -hmm. which which wasn't entirely successful for me in every every way, but was trying to tell a mature story. Um, and, and it was a it didn't, um, and The Martian as well, which is coming out shortly as well, same, same thing. It's not a, a wham bam, flash Gordon, you know, skipping bikinis and ray guns in space story. It's a, a story of somebody surviving and using science. Um, I think there's, there is a sort of growing awareness that there is an audience out there who don't necessarily need to be led by the hand you don't need the sort of flash wow visuals of Star Wars um, in order to, to tell uh, an interesting and, and captivating story. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, in general with the genre, I mean, do you, are you quite hopeful for it? Do you, is there anything in particular that, that you think you could do with doing better to really push it on to another level? Um, in film or in? Uh, in general, uh, in writing or, I think, Probably especially in writing because that perhaps is suffering the most as a result of other formats being so prominent. I think at the moment we're, we're actually existing in an interesting period of science fiction because we had um, sort of the, the, the new wave of the 70s and then cyberpunk of the 80s and 90s and then we had steampunk in the early 2000s. At the moment we seem to be in a bit of a flux between there's no, there doesn't seem to be any one unifying theme going on. Um, 
which is a good thing from my point of view because there are people telling all sorts of stories um, in all sorts of formats. There's sort of uh, magical realism and then there's um, you know, old fashioned space opera, there's sort of new revisionist space opera, and, uh, people like Anne Mackey and so on. But there's no kind of one movement that we get as writers, we can be more individual and kind of pick and choose. Um, I'll just wait and see what that one next big development is going to be. It's like where the singularity was a big thing for a while and that's kind of dropped away a bit. And I think we're just waiting for what the next big scientific development is going to be. Um, whether that will be the discovery of you know an Earth-like planet with signs of life on it or whether it be, you know, um, I don't know what it would be. You know, that something will come along shortly, which I think is going to completely galvanise the field again. Some young, some young heroes, some young protagonists. <laughs> Possibly, I, I read something in New Scientist the other day about um, uh, chimps having language and the, you know involving the language the level of a two-year-old, I think, and um, you know, about uh, people um, networking chimp brains to form one big brain, and it's all wow. it's in the book. So, well, yeah. so got a got a good treatment, I suppose, of the the Planet of the Apes movies that you don't want to and that life seems to be catching up with art. Yeah. You've been quite prominent on the convention circuit uh, for, for many years, and um, although Nine Worlds is quite a, quite a new convention, and it, it seems to be trying to embrace more various different things, not only just books, uh, what's been your experience of Nine Worlds and, and how are you finding it? Well, there's, there's so much going on here, there's so many different, um, different sort of streams from uh, the, I've mainly been in the book stream, but there's sort of cosplaying and gaming and, and, and all sorts. So it, there's just something here for, for everybody, really. If you're a geek about something, it seems there's something here somewhere that someone's running a, a discussion panel. Um, as, as to the experience of it, I find it quite relaxed. It's a very kind of the, the mellow vibe. It's quite busy. It's quite busy, um, but it's everyone seems to be fairly relaxed. It's not. Um, it's not quite maybe quite as manic as a, an Easter con. So it seems to be much more kind of a laid back, a laid back kind of vibe, and uh, everybody's kind of just doing their own thing. Yeah. And are you enjoying being on this side of it, involved with the panels and book signings and things, as opposed to maybe on the other side, getting to have the freedom to go around and just go and see what you want to see? Yeah. Well, the nice thing is I've, I've, I've finished my panel items now, and so I've got all the remainder of the conventions out all day tomorrow just to sort of hang out and meet people. And, chat with friends and go and see panels. Yeah. I get the best of both worlds. Yeah. I suppose sometimes we lose sight of that with uh, you know, people who are involved and their authors and that, that we think they're, they're just over there and don't actually get involved with, within the circle. But I, I started coming to conventions um, as a fan really. I mean, when, when I sold my first story to Interzone way back in 2006 or something, I came to an Eastercon not knowing anybody all by myself and um, so I've kind of I've kind of grown up over the last few years sort of as a writer but I'm still very much a part of me is coming into these things as a fan. Great. Well thanks again for catching up with us. It was, it was good to, to catch you briefly and, and yeah see how things are going and uh, hopefully catch up with you again in the near future. Great, thank you very much.